due west on I-84. And I don't know if any of you noticed, but I certainly did. It was a full moon that day. And the setting of the moon was at about 5.15, 5.30 that morning when I was on the road. And I swear I came around the bend and dead ahead of me, center of the highway, was the big full moon, not 20 minutes away from setting um, and guiding, guiding my way. I received that as, as a light to guide my way on Friday morning. And it brought to mind a song, which was also um, early on one of the, the theme songs of a favorite television show, which was based in, of all places, Cleveland, Ohio. Does anybody remember Drew Carey's show? And do you remember the song that opened in their first few seasons? Moon over Parma. Now, if some of you are nodding. Do you want to sing it? No. That's all right. I remember Moon over Parma. And that day, Friday morning, I had Moon over somewhere to the west, which was my destination. <coughs> and I found my way safely here. And I feel the blessing even now to be here amongst you, sharing what we share, what we have in common, our value for the teachings of Jesus Christ and relationship with God. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we consider the ancient words of wisdom left by our ancestors in faith, we pray that you might help us to keep our hearts and our minds open and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart truly serve in a way that is faithful and that helps to reveal the meaning of your word and your purpose for us in this day and this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you a reading, <clears throat> excuse me, from the gospel according to Luke this morning. In chapter 16, you heard Helen refer to this very passage. And, and we're going to, as um, uh, Emro Lagasse says, kick it up a notch during our adult worship time. Um, this, is, uh, this reading is from the New Revised Standard Version. Do I have that right, Gay? Is that what's behind me? I'm not going to look because I've got it right here in front of me. But if you're following this, or whatever version you have, I want you to consider the words here, because this is a very, very interesting, I find it interesting teaching by the rabbi Jesus Christ. He said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. I'm going to key on that word, squandering, ask you to keep that in mind. It's not a word we use that often, but Jesus uses it in this teaching, because this man was squandering the property of the rich man. And so the rich man summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do? Now that my master is taking the position away from me, what will I do? I am not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. And so, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? And he answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? And he replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal home. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. 
You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, I offered a reflection on this very passage to a church in Richmond, Virginia. When I left Akron in the Miller Avenue Church, I served as an interim for 16 months at St. John's United Church of Christ, right down in the center of Richmond, another city church. The focused verse that I used at that time was verse number two. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. It appealed to me at that time, at least in part, because I had personal experience on which to base my reflection. You see, I'm a second career minister, and when I was in my first career for a trucking company, I was an, order, uh, an auditor. And I related to the job of this manager, and especially the way he did it right after he had been taken to task by his benefactor. And so my sermonizing that day was about taking assessment of the various assets of the church and putting them to work in the world as exemplified by the work of this dishonest manager in collecting debts for his boss. And now, now it looks as if I've delivered the same sermon that took me 20 minutes several years ago in less than five. So what do you say we'll move on to the offering now? <laughs> No, none of us are getting off that easy. Today I've been invited by the scripture to work on my relationship with God. And today I'm going to share that invitation with you. Now this gospel parable opens up with what appears to be the end of a relationship. You cannot be my manager any longer. But it finishes with a relationship statement as well. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the bit of wisdom that is the focus of reflection this morning. You cannot serve God and wealth. In order to relate to this summary statement, I had to go back to Jesus' opening line just before or at the beginning of this parable. He says, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. Now, generally speaking, I don't think of myself as one who squanders. What's that word mean to you? Anybody have a, a meaning for the word squander? Waste, thank you. This is my friend Jerry, by the way. I don't know if you met Jerry, but I met him <coughs> yesterday. And we sat together for a good long time at, whose garage was that we were? Ralph. Ralph's garage. And I don't know who was selling anything. Apparently there was a lot being sold, but. Jerry and I were otherwise occupied. And we did not prepare, by the way, with the definition of squander. So, waste is one word. Does anybody have another word that goes for squander? Or is Jerry the only one who knows about squandering here? <laughs> Come on, Ernie, you must know. What's squander mean? To waste. To waste, certainly. Okay, well, waste. Waste is a good definition. There are a few other words that might come to mind. Spend or dissipate. Misuse, how about that? Does that appeal? Lavish, lavish, I looked this up. You can tell consume is another word. Throw away or fritter away, that's waste, yes? None of these sound so good. And as I say, I do not regard myself as a squanderer for the most part. But here in this passage from Luke's Gospel, Jesus is using a parable to teach about relationship with God. And this gives me pause. If it's a Jesus teaching, and if it's about relationship with God, then maybe I'd best not dismiss it quite so readily. Maybe I'd better not squander this invitation. Maybe I should take an extra moment to consider, how is my relationship with God? So let's consider, consider the evidence. My relationship with God includes a number of things. I belong to a church. Except for a relatively brief period in my 20s, I've belonged to a church all along. I make regular contribution to the church in the offering plate. Not quite a tithe, but <clears throat> I tell myself I give according to my means. 
And sometimes I make an extra contribution to one church or another or to a special cause or to some charity. And let's not forget, I'm a minister. That's got to make me close to God, right? These are pretty easy statements, though. This is the low-hanging fruit, as they say. So let me ask you all, how would you describe the evidence of your relationship with God? Yes, that was a question. How would you describe the evidence of your relationship with God? Helen? Go ahead. You can speak quietly. I'll hear you. Oh, with my relationship? Yes, your relationship with God. I try to be a faithful servant. A faithful servant. A faithful servant. Okay. CB, you got something to say. I know you do. What, what's evidence of your relationship with God? I get careless sometimes. You get chills sometimes? Careless. Sometimes. Careless sometimes. Oh, my goodness. Wow. All right. You, you have a bumper sticker. That there you are. You got a relationship with God. There are going to be some questions, by the way. So you got to you got to be better prepared here, folks. Shout it out when I ask you a question. I appreciate the sharing. I really do. And I have to admit, there's a little bit of a trick in this question about relationship with God, which explains your caution. I know. As I read it, the manager of Jesus' teaching thought his relationship with his master called for him to do nothing more than occupy the position. Just show up. That's all. He seems to think he has it made, that his relationship with the boss is quite secure. But when he finds out otherwise, he uses his position to make deals and concessions with the wealth of the master and thereby ingratiate himself with others in the community. Now, I don't know about you, but this guy just doesn't seem right to me. He doesn't seem tuned into the demands of relationship, to the requirement that one actually participate actively in the building of bonds and strengthening connections. In short, he seems to take relationship with his master, i.e., God, he seemed to take it for granted. He squanders it. Let me give you a clue about what I'm thinking here. Whenever we think we're totally and completely secure in our relationship with God, then, like the dishonest manager in this story, we need to stop and think it over. We dare not take relationship with God for granted. This means that belonging to church is not sufficient evidence of relationship with God, nor is a bumper sticker. It means that regular contributions to the offering plate don't make it either, and neither does being a minister. Even though these may seem useful and meaningful, they fall short of the relationship expectations that Jesus is teaching about. In fact, and this, this I think is the Jesus definition of squander, anything that is not a direct response to the most important commandments offered in another Jesus teaching qualifies as squandering. I'll say a little bit more about those commandments in just a minute, but I want to take another moment to consider what happens in this, in this parable, this teaching. The manager is taken to task for squandering the rich man's property. In response, he begins to make deals with others using the rich man's property so as to secure favor elsewhere. It's not hard to understand his rationale. In fact, he explains it quite clearly. He says, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I'm dismissed as manager, the people may welcome me into their homes. Makes sense, sort of, but it's still dishonest. And this is such a good parable teaching that everyone who hears it, including the dishonest manager, shares the same experience at the rich man's response. 
according to the paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, I'm sure you've heard of it before, 